Okay, everyone. Um, today's speaker, uh, it just couldn't be more timely, um, given uh, what's going on in the world. And when I set up this uh, talk for today, uh, five or six, or was looking for someone to speak to us about six weeks ago, um, right in the midst of the inauguration and everything, you know, I thought, oh, maybe, maybe this will still be timely. <laughs> it's even more timely after um, the election. It, it, you'd think after this last four years, we could move on, but, but no way. Um, this, is, this is a topic I think that's not gonna go away. So I couldn't be happier to have with us today, Professor Mike Steenson. He is the Bell Distinguished Professor of Law at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. He's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and the University of Iowa School of Law. Following graduation, he clerked for the Honorable Miles W. Lord on the United States District Court for the District of Minnesota, and then began a long teaching career at what was then called William Mitchell College of Law, and it's now Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. Professor Steenson is a member of the American Law Institute and a fellow of the American Bar Foundation. He teaches in the areas of torts, constitutional law, including the First Amendment, and American legal history. Professor Steenson is going to speak to us for 40, 45 minutes or so um, with a presentation, PowerPoint presentation. And if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to include them in the chat. We have a couple of, uh, of our uh, members monitoring the chat. If there's something that needs to be asked immediately, um, otherwise, let's hold our questions till he's finished, and then we'll open it all up to Q&A. As I said before, uh, probably best to put it on uh, speaker view now and make sure you're muted. And I'm going to turn it over to Professor Steenson. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Audrey. It's really nice to be here. Bear with me for a minute while I do a screen share and get hopefully the right set of slides up. There we go. Um, if you want, you can note at the outset what my uh, email is, should you uh, wish to email me. Maybe you want a copy of these slides, and if you do, that's fine. I'd be happy to email them to you. I don't know if they're going to generally be available. Audrey, are they? I would assume so. <clears throat> yes, we are, we are recording this uh, today, and we will be posting it to our YouTube cha channel. All right. Well, it's good that we're not going to be talking about anything that's particularly controversial today. Um, I'm sure many of you have questions about the scope of the First Amendment, what the, pur what the purpose is of the uh, First Amendment. I expect that what I'll do today is to leave you with far more questions than answers. At the outset, however, I would, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to have you think about why in uh, the United States we seem to place such a high value on freedom of speech, um, why you value freedom of speech, and I assume that you do. And, and so the question is why? What is it that we're, that we're trying to achieve with freedom of speech and freedom of expression? And what are the limitations on freedom of speech? I think we all saw that perhaps those limits were certainly full display on January 2nd, uh, and post January 2nd. Well, I'm going to, going to approach this in separate parts. Part of it will deal with just a basic history of the First Amendment, some theoretical history, and then a second part, First Amendment application, cases where government can regulate conduct and cases where government cannot regulate conduct. We'll talk about the internet and the First Amendment, and when government is entitled to regulate the internet and when it's not. We'll talk about the liability of internet providers, whether or not they're responsible for their content or should be responsible for their content, and perhaps how they go about deciding what the content should be on their web pages, and whether or not they ought to be regulated, those internet providers. Should they be regulated publicly? Should they be regulated privately? All right, so to begin with, and we'll just do a, a short history. There's a long, long 
uh, history, of course, of freedom of speech, but I'm just gonna go back to the middle of the, of the 17th century and Milton's Areopagitica. And of course, it's a strong uh, criticism of press licensing by parliament. And it's strong advocacy of freedom of speech and expression, although not for everybody, uh, certainly not for Catholics. Um, but it's an early, an early defense of freedom of speech. It becomes important in other subsequent expositions on the importance of freedom of speech. Now, one of my favorites is from Cato's letter, number 15. Uh, Cato's letters were written, of course, by Trenchard and Gordon, so-called Commonwealth men, in the early part of the uh, 18th century, and they railed against corruption and tyranny in English government. Trenchard and Gordon were called by Bernard Balin in his excellent book, The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution, the Cassandras of their age, um, destined to speak the truth, but never to be believed. Well, they really gained traction during the American Revolution and they became a significant part, one of the most significant parts of revolutionary ideology. You can't have freedom of thought absent freedom of speech. You can't have wisdom, Adam, uh, or absent, I'm sorry, freedom of speech. It's a great bulwark of liberty and they prosper and die together. It's the terror of traitors and oppressors and a barrier against them. All right, so Trenchard and Gore uh, are really important in the ideology of the American Revolution. And keep in mind, of course, that the First Amendment isn't actually adopted until 1791, but after the Declaration of Independence, freedom of speech became critical in the state constitutions. And of course, the positions taken in the state constitutions became really important in the drafting of the federal constitution and of course, in the Bill of Rights. All right, well, later, John Stuart Mill on liberty, great utilitarian defense of liberty. There has to be liberty of conscience in order to foster good government. All right, well, it's pretty clear that the justices of the Supreme Court of the United States in dealing with First Amendment issues were familiar with these works. In fact, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. in 1919 made it a point uh, to reread John Stuart Mill on liberty as he was preparing to write his opinion in the Abrams case, which I'll get to in just a second. All right, so you really need to have, and this is critical, you really need to have conflicting opinions. It's only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder of truth has any chance of being supplied. There are a lot of things that we'd like to listen to and a lot of things that we don't like to listen to. But ultimately, if we're going to try to determine what truth is in any context, we need to see those conflicting opinions. All right, now the First Amendment, and this is only part of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It says Congress shall make no law. As adopted, the First Amendment says absolutely nothing about the states. Now, more about that later. Now, Abrams versus the United States is one of a series of several cases involving <clears throat> Espionage Act prosecutions of people who engaged in various sorts of efforts to stop the war or impede the war effort, World War I, including, among others, Eugene B. Debs, who was sentenced to a lengthy prison term before it was commuted for an anti-war speech in Canton, Ohio. Now, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. in some of those critical cases developed a clear and present danger test, which was really based upon the criminal law of attempts. If what you said was likely to have the effect of impeding the war effort, then you could be punished for it under the Espionage Act. <clears throat> All right, well, Abrams was a little bit different. Abrams was actually held over from the 1919 term uh, and uh, re-argued in 1919 in the fall. Over the summer, Holmes had been heavily criticized for the position that he had taken in those prior Espionage Act cases. He was not speech friendly at all. He did develop the clear and present danger test, 
but it hit like a hammer against dissidents at the time. Abrams versus the United States was a little bit different. Holmes had a chance to rethink his position over that summer of 1919, and he came out swinging in his dissenting opinion in the Abrams case. These people, I suppose today they'd be called the Abrams Five, were convicted of conspiring to violate the Sedition Act of 1918. And they were not so much anti-war um, pamphlets that they circulated, these rebels and anarchists. Uh, one was a socialist and the others were Jewish anarchists. Um, and uh, they made no attempt, by the way, the Abrams Five to become citizens of the uh, United States, but they certainly didn't want the United States to in any way interfere with Russian Revolution. All right, well, they got convicted. Four of them were sentenced to 20 years in prison. Molly Steimer was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Their sentences were terminated when they were all deported. Um, and they either fell victim to the, to the Holocaust or to Stalin's purges, except for Molly Steimer, who was something else. Uh, she ultimately ended up getting deported from Russia and she ended up going to Mexico. Uh, so she survived, but they were all convicted based upon the criminal law of attempts. Well, Holmes really didn't like the result in this case and he changed a little bit. Now, Holmes took the position <clears throat> that uh, there wasn't anything in these pamphlets that in any way constituted an attack on the form of the government of the United States. He didn't question the results in the previous cases. Of course, he had written those opinions, but he thought that there has to be a, a limitation on government's ability to interfere with freedom of speech. There certainly has to be a clear and present danger. But this is really um, critical. He takes the position that the theory underlying the First Amendment should be the marketplace of ideas theory. Well, you saw that quite directly in John Stuart Mill's theory. As I said, Holmes read John Stuart Mill over the summer of 1919. All right, so Holmes not only now has a theory, but he has a doctrine to implement that theory. The theory, of course, is the marketplace of ideas theory. The best test of truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. All right, that's the best way to determine truth. That, at any rate, he says, is the theory of our Constitution. All right, so Holmes not only develops the theory of the marketplace of ideas. And keep in mind that the First Amendment has been essentially dormant throughout the history of the United States. It comes to life because of these anti-war speech and expression suppressions. All right, marketplace of ideas and the implementing doctrine is the clear and present danger doctrine. Can government regulate speech? Yes, if there's a clear and present danger of some sort of evil that Congress has a right to regulate. All right, now, the <clears throat> First and Fourteenth Amendments, keep in mind, as I just noted, that the First Amendment applies to Congress. Well, how does it, how does it get applied to the states? Well, it takes the ratification of the Fourteenth Amendment for that to occur. Fourteenth Amendment is ratified in 1868, and it provides, in part, in Section 1, that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. All right, well, there's a good question here. What does due process have to do with the First Amendment? Well, through a process called selective incorporation, the Supreme Court decided that certain amendments, if they were implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, would apply to the states. The court applied or assumed the application of the First Amendment for the first time to the states in 1925. You keep in mind that, the, that, again, the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, one of the Reconstruction Amendments. All right, so finally, 1925, the court in the uh, Gitlow case assumes the application of the First Amendment to the states and then decides that it does, in fact, apply to the states in Fisk versus Kansas, 1927. All right, now, in Whitney versus California, 
uh, in the court as in Whitney or in the uh, Gitlow cases dealing with the criminal syndicalism statute. Now these statutes are a little bit different than statutes which apply such as the Espionage Act uh, to direct almost physical impairment of the war effort. This applies to doctrines that advocate the idea of overthrow of the government, advocate an idea, not just action. It applies to the advocacy of thought. All right. So we're taking a major step under these circumstances, but nonetheless, in these criminal syndicalism cases, certainly Gitlow and certainly Whitney, Justice Sanford applies a very low level of review and concludes that, well, this is certainly an appropriate exercise of the state's police power. State has a right to enact legislation for the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. And that includes the suppression of speech if it's likely to be dangerous. All right, so Justice Brandeis, concurring in this particular case, gets into a little more detail on what the purpose is of the First Amendment. It's to make people free to develop their faculties. All right, freedom to think as you will and speak as you think are indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. So the First Amendment is critical if you're thinking about why freedom of speech is important to you. It's important because of personal autonomy. We have a right to think and to speak, to hear what other people think about and speak about from the standpoint of our own personal development. How do you develop your own ideas? Well, you read about them, you talk about them, you think about them, you hear what other people have to say. It's important from the standpoint of personal autonomy and most certainly to the spread of political truth. How do we know which person to vote for? What position to take on government initiatives if we don't have freedom of speech and freedom of thought? It's important to the spread of political truth. All right. Well, the fact that speech might potentially result in violence or the destruction of property really isn't enough, he says, to justify suppression. There's got to be some serious injury to the state before there can be regulation. Okay. Well, so why do we care about state action? Now, this is really important because I think very often you, you hear people say, well, my First Amendment rights are, are being interfered with by so-and-so. A private person maybe has the bully pulpit or forces somebody to, uh, to stop speaking. Well, private people cannot deprive other private people of First Amendment rights. Only government can do that. So it takes state action. Now, it could be that a person is harmed by the speech of another individual. If somebody engages in repeated efforts, for example, to collect a debt from an individual, that's speech, but certainly it's gonna provide the basis for a tort action, something that we call the intentional infliction of emotional distress. Somebody may injure your reputation by accusing you of committing a crime. All right, well, you have a defamation claim then against that individual to vindicate your reputation and to collect damages for any injury that's caused to that reputation. All right, so First Amendment only applies to action by the state. We go back to the 14th Amendment. No state shall deprive any person of due process of law. Only the state can deprive people of First Amendment rights, not private individuals. All right, so what that means then is that social networking sites aren't state action and that the operators are not subject to the First Amendment. You might think that they are, and it's certainly arguable that social networking sites have provided the opportunity for an explosion of public participation um, in debates over the important issues of our time. And that's certainly true. But you need state action in order to have a First Amendment issue. All right, now applying the First Amendment, there's a, a basic rule that says that government as a general pop, uh, proposition can't regulate the content of speech. And if government does that, then something called strict scrutiny applies. That means that government really is gonna have to provide a compelling justification 
for legislation and that that legislation is going to have to be narrowly tailored to achieve that goal. It's a very, very difficult standard to meet. And I guess the question is why? You know, why don't we, why don't we have a situation such as in the Gitlo case or the Whitney case where government is deferred to in regulating speech? Well, this is why. West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett is a, is a really good example. This is a case that was decided on Flag Day in the middle of World War II. Now, the West Virginia Board of Education adopted a resolution ordering flag salutes to be a, a regular part of the program of the activities in the public schools. And if you look carefully, by the way, look at the uh, direction of the hands. The initial flag salute looked like this. Well, that looked an awful lot, an awful lot like the salute that the Nazis were using. So West Virginia turned the hand so that the palm would face up. All right, this fell very heavily on kids who were Jehovah's Witnesses because it was against their religious beliefs to salute the flag. They challenged this regulation. And in fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses made a fair amount of First Amendment law. Um, okay, so the point here as the court holds that there can't be any compelled speech is kind of a critical one. And it's a theme that runs throughout the court's First Amendment cases. If there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, Justice Jackson says, it's that no official can prescribe what's gonna be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or, or for citizens to confess by word or act their faith. So the court held that the flag salute was unconstitutional. All right, but a key point here is that government can't dictate to us what to think, what to say, or to follow the government with respect to ideas. Government can't force us to do that. It's a critical point in First Amendment theory. But, you know, there are cases. There are cases where people cross the line. And while the First Amendment says Congress, and now that includes the states, shall make no law abridging freedom of speech or the press, it sounds like an absolute, but it really isn't an absolute. There are various sorts of exceptions. A fighting words exception, kind of words that would provoke a reasonable person uh, to respond physically. Incitement to imminent lawless action. And we certainly have seen an awful lot about the incitement exception. We've seen this most certainly on January 6th and in the impeachment proceedings. There's not constitutional protection, not full constitutional protection for obscenity, child pornography, and sometimes profanity and decent speech, but that depends on what medium it appears maybe on radio, maybe less so if we're dealing with attempts to regulate it on the internet. True threats and intimidation are not protected by the First Amendment. Commercial speech gets less protection, advertising. Government speech, the government certainly gets to advocate its own ideas. So if you think about the uh, Trump administration's 1776 pamphlet, that's government speech. And if government is the speaker, government can say what it wants to say without worrying about wanting to foul of the First Amendment. So there are exceptions, but these are heavily litigated. The scope of these exceptions didn't arise just overnight. Now, Brandenburg versus Ohio was really culmination of decisions involving clear and present danger and criminal syndicalism dating back to 1919, 1925, and 1927. Brandenburg involved some small group, about 12 members of the Ku Klux Klan and got together on some uh, private land and burned across and wanted to send certain individuals back to the places where they came. Um, all right, so the question was whether or not they could be punished under the Ohio criminal syndicalism statute. <clears throat> and in a procurium opinion, the Supreme Court of the United States said no not unless this standard is met. So this is the incitement standard. And you probably have seen reference to this in the newspapers, television reports of the events of January 6th. Free speech and free press guarantees don't permit a state to forbid or prescribe advocacy of the use of force 
for the law of violation unless, unless the advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce imminent lawless action. And there are clear distinctions between the advocacy of ideas and the advocacy of action. You have a right to advocate ideas without fear of punishment. You don't have a right to advocate action if it's likely to produce imminent lawless action. All right. So Brandenburg versus Ohio. Well, what about regulating hate speech? You know, that's a major issue today, hate speech. It appears in um, the most scurrilous forms, and it's really incredibly damaging. Now, St. Paul, several years ago, adopted an ordinance, and I think it was prompted in part by temple defacements in St. Paul. St. Paul adopted this ordinance, and, and take a look at it, and tell me if you can just on its face see anything wrong with it. So if somebody places on public or private property a symbol, object, appellation, and so on, it could include a burning cross, and the person knows that it's likely to arouse anger, alarm, or resentment on the basis of race and color, creed, religion, and so on, then it's a misdemeanor. All right, RAV, who at the time was, uh, was a young skinhead in uh, St. Paul with some companions, decided that it would be a good idea to burn a makeshift cross on the lawn of the only African-American family in the neighborhood. Well, you can imagine what the impact was on that family. All right, well, could anybody object to a, a statute that, that gets at this kind of terrible hate speech? Well, Supreme Court of the United States held that this is unconstitutional because it constitutes viewpoint-based discrimination. This was an opinion by Justice Anton Scalia. And it's interesting because the conservative justices of the Supreme Court of the United States have been very, very speech protected. All right. Well, it's viewpoint based because it only gets at discrimination based upon race, color, creed, religion, or gender. Okay. All right. Well, let's go back to West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. Government can't prescribe to us what's orthodox in speech. Government can't single out certain kinds of expression, certain kinds of speech for punishment. Because of that viewpoint-based discrimination, the court said it's unconstitutional. All right, so um, government can regulate this, but it has to be done according to a neutral statute. So if RAV had been uh, prosecuted under uh, a city ordinance, prohibiting terroristic threats in general. That would have been fine because it's not viewpoint-based discrimination. Government can't pick and choose what's going to be orthodox. Once again, key point from the Barnett case. All right, well, what about recovery for emotional harm? People do just awful, awful things to each other and they can cause serious emotional harm. Now, in this case, Matthew Snyder was a Lance Corporal when he was killed in the line of duty in Iraq. At his funeral, there were protests by the Westboro Baptist Church, the Phelpsians. You probably have heard about them, read about them, seen them on television. Um, they particularly single out military funerals because they tend to get pretty solid press coverage because of this. All right, so now they picketed on public land and they were where they had a right to be. They weren't engaging in any other sort of protest that violated basic restrictions. They were in a place where they had a right to be. They met with time, place, and manner restrictions, but their signs were awful. And you can see what they, what they say. So their notion is that um, the deaths of these soldiers in part is God's punishment for the liberal attitudes in the United States with respect to homosexuality, for example, or those are the Phelpsians. Mr. Phelps sues for the emotional distress that he suffered because of the impact that it had on him when he realized what these signs were. He's burying his son. All right, now he recovered substantial damages in the lower court, but ultimately the Supreme Court of the United States says he's not entitled to recover. These messages, messages certainly aren't refined social or political commentary. 
but they relate to matters of public concern. And Mr. Phelps can't recover for his emotional harm. You can't pick and choose based upon whether or not some people think these messages based upon matters of public concern are offensive. All right. So defamation. What happens in situations where somebody defames another individual? Um, really, one of the most important things we all have going for us is our right to sue in a defamation action. Could be libel if it's a written word, could be slander if it's the spoken word. Okay, well, what about situations where somebody charges a public official with conduct in office or defames a public figure? No problem if it's slowed down, dirty backyard gossip. We have a right to was who for defamation. But what if there are important public issues involved, public figures and public officials? Well, the Supreme Court of the United States stepped in and one of the great constitutional decisions of the court, New York Times Company versus uh, Solomon, and said that even false statements are gonna be protected by the First Amendment, false statements of fact, unless the public official or the public figure who is suing for defamation uh, can establish something that the court calls actual malice. And that means that the plaintiff is gonna to have to show that the defendant published the defamatory matter, either knowing that it's false or in reckless disregard of the truth. All right, it's a very difficult standard to establish. It's intended to give the press substantial breathing room. We want discourse on public issues. And this was incredibly important when this case initially arose, this advertisement in 1960 in the New York Times that led to this litigation. Um, defamation litigation was part of the strategy of Southern public officials to try to bring Northern liberal newspapers such as the New York Times to their knees through libel judgments and absent New York Times company versus Sullivan that may well have succeeded. All right, now, um, First Amendment and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, a couple of other things that I wanna point out. We have these sort of limited exceptions, but what happens if somebody does something that's just incredibly egregious? So United States versus Stevens, for example, <clears throat> involves a statute that Congress passed that involves selling, um, for example, for commercial gain, depictions of animal cruelty. Well, Stevens in this particular case sold videos involving pit bulls fighting, killing other animals. All right, well, I'd, I'd see what the value was in that. The real purpose of this legislation was to get at something called crush videos. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna disgust anyone, but a crush video is typically a video, usually of women, wearing stiletto heels, walking around crushing small animals to death. Congress wanted to get at that. Congress wanted to get at animal cruelty. Well, Supreme Court said, no, not under the circumstances. This is an overbroad statute. This could apply, for example, even to the sale of a hunting video in the District of Columbia, where hunting is illegal. All right, so it's an overbroad statute. And no matter how reprehensible this kind of conduct is, the court said, we're not gonna create a new exception. The Alvarez case. Alvarez was a serial liar. Of course, falsity is protected. We know that from the New York Times Company versus Sullivan. And the court refused to carve out a separate exception to deal with that kind of situation. The court's very reluctant to expand on those categorical exceptions that I was just talking about. It's a very First Amendment protective Supreme Court of the United States. All right, now the First Amendment and the internet. Remember, for the First Amendment to apply, there has to be state action. Well, it doesn't apply to private individuals. So if there aren't statutory or regulatory limitations imposed by government, the First Amendment won't apply. Okay, now government might try to do a couple of different things in enacting legislation. Maybe government wants to restrict people's access to the internet or wants to restrict the content on the internet. Both face significant First Amendment hurdles. Remember, government doesn't get to pick and choose. West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. Packing versus North Carolina is a really good example. Registered sex offenders don't get to act, uh, access 
social networking websites where the sex offender knows that the site permits minor children. Okay. Well, this can include social media, certainly Twitter, Facebook, but also Amazon, WashingtonPost.com, WebMD. So this was a pretty broad statute. All right, well, Packingham, who's probably not the, the, the brightest person, um, just judging from his Facebook posting, uh, is quite excited because he manages to get a dismissal of his traffic ticket and makes a post on Facebook that violates the statute. He's convicted of violating the statute and he's given a suspended sentence. Okay, well, there's a working principle here. And this is really important. <clears throat> Fundamental principle is that people ought to have access to places where they can speak and listen to all sorts of forums. Government can't restrict our right to speak, protest in traditional public forums, for example, sidewalks, the streets, parks. These are traditional public fora. And we have a right to go there, speak, listen, as we see fit. All right, well, well, this is not a public forum in the sense that government created the forum. It's a quintessential forum for the exercise of First Amendment rights. And in this situation, it's very important to have access to the vast democratic forum of the internet in general and social media in particular. All right, and so the court says that excluding Packingham under this very broad statute is unconstitutional. Now there are ways to do it, but the legislation would have to be more narrowly tailored. All right, no communications, for example, through any of these social media with a minor might do it. It was too broad. All right, so violates the First Amendment. Now there are attempts by Congress in the past to try to limit access to the internet. Reno versus ACLU. Um, and this is also part of the Communications Decency Act, which I'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute. We have about five minutes left. All right, so this pro prohibits the statute, the knowing transmission of obscene or indecent messages to people under the age of 18. All right, patently offensive messages in a way that would be offensive to somebody under 18. Well, I don't know what indecent means. I don't know what patently offensive means. Court says this is overbroad and it gives government way too much authority to regulate con uh, content on the internet. Well, the United States said this is just this is like cyber zoning. We're setting aside a certain part of the internet that uh, can't be accessed. Well, court says, no, no, this isn't like regulation of adult bookstores. It's a content-based regulation. And once again, government is telling us what we get access to. Can't do that. It's unconstitutional under the First Amendment. All right, and then the same thing with Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, but I'm going to jump over Ashcroft just to get to critical question here involving Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, sometimes called the 26 words that uh, created the internet. So look at the way it reads. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. All right, so if somebody defames you and does so on social media, you certainly have a lawsuit against that individual, but can you sue the person who's the publisher? Can you sue Facebook? Can you sue Twitter? If somebody nails you to the wall and, uh, and uh, publishes scurrilous defamatory matter about you? Uh, well, the answer is no. You don't treat the internet providers as publishers or speakers. All right, so they're immune. And so one of the questions is whether or not there should be this kind of broad immunity. Internet providers also can't be held liable if they act in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider thinks may be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, and so on. All right, well, what if uh, social media platforms decide to preclude somebody from having access to the social media? Banning somebody from Facebook, for example, banning somebody from Twitter. Can they do that? Yes, they're not government actors. 
So they can do it unless there's some sort of a limitation. Well, that's why we're now starting to see proposals for limiting Section 230. Now, the argument in favor of 230 is the threat of lawsuits would make it impossible to operate these interactive websites. The argument against, of course, is that, well, look, these companies are profiting to a significant extent, but they're not responsible for the content. All right. So should there be a regulation of access? Do you want to stop people from gaining access to the uh, internet? Do you want to control the content of the internet? All right, well, we've seen what the First Amendment problems are. In doing so, that makes legislation amending 230 a major political issue, and it's getting kicked around like crazy right now. All right, well, short of that, Facebook is, and this comes from Facebook's webpage, Facebook is really trying to support, it says, thoughtful updates to internet laws. And in fact, Facebook has an oversight board. Some people call it the Facebook Supreme Court, which will be considering, among other things, whether or not uh, a very prominent person will get back the right to uh, participate in Facebook. And it's a really, really interesting issue. Why the oversight board? Well. This oversight board is supposed to use independent judgment in determining whether or not decisions to take down um, certain content or bar certain people from participating um, are justifiable. It doesn't have to do with keep up, it has to do with take down. All right, now, um, the Twitter rules. This is a good website to, uh, um, to take a look at. Uh, it's a it's an excellent article on, uh, or I'm sorry, um, I should say there's an excellent article. Maybe I did not include that um, in the uh, in the New Yorker, uh, February twelfth, I believe. Okay, so Twitter, same sort of thing. Twitter has these basic purposes. These are the Twitter rules. You can find those on that website. These are some of the safety rules. Twitter safety, September 10th, starting next week. Twitter says, we're gonna label, remove false or misleading information. So you've seen what happened, right? During the course of the, uh, of the last election and Twitter did just exactly this. All right, now statutory modifications. There's FOSTA Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act that's trying to get its sex trafficking on the internet. There are differing viewpoints as to how effective that's been. And we have now, among other things, this proposed Safe Tech Act. And one of the sponsors of this legislation is Amy Klobuchar. And it's intended to significantly limit or would have the effect of significantly limiting Section 230. And it would tend to hold social media accountable to a much, much greater degree, but in a way that many people argue would interfere significantly with the First Amendment. All right, well, that's it in a nutshell. And I will, uh, I will stop right there and see if people have questions or comments on any of these issues. Thanks for listening. Okay, well, I just want to thank you, Professor, for your presentation it was excellent. Um, very thought provoking. And we're going to go into our Q&A session right now. And because we have so many people on the Zoom uh, call today, I'd like people to use the uh, the icon, the Zoom icon, the, the yellow hand. Do people know where how to access that? I have a uh, iPad, and it's where it says more. It may be different in different uh, computers or, or tablets, where it says raise hand. And if you raise your hand, there's this little icon that shows, and then I'll know that you have a question, and uh, I'll be able to uh, do this in an orderly manner instead of trying to hug it, hunt them back when people raise their hands on the, uh, on the view that I have. So think of a question. And um, the first two questions I have, first one is from Roy, and then the next one is from Dave, Dave Gill. So uh, Roy, would you ask the professor uh, the question you have? And then Dave, can you then follow Roy? I'll try. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I've often thought that, uh, any uh, profound statements uh, in any medium uh, 
should uh, should be able to uh, uh, have to provide the verifiable, verifiable evidence as to what they are saying is an actual fact. Uh, otherwise, it should be labeled as an opinion or some such uh, thing like that. Uh, but I, I don't really see that uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, so that way, uh, you know, a lot of people believe some pretty weird stuff and there is absolutely no evidence to support it. And they need to understand that. Would that be possible? Well, you know, it's really interesting. There's a massive amount of misinformation and disinformation as uh, Cass Sunstein pointed out in, uh, in a uh, recent uh, article, people have always taken unusual positions. He used the word crazy. Uh, but the problem is now that certainly the internet provides the opportunity for magnification of those principles. Now, if we're talking about newspapers, well, it depends on what medium we're talking about. There isn't any way to verify what happens if uh, somebody takes a position, QAnon, for example, and pushes it on um, a social media platform. Now, if it's, if it's erroneous, maybe Twitter is going to comment on it, maybe Facebook is going to comment on it, but there are other uh, platforms where there won't be any regulation uh, at all, and people tend to believe it. All right, well, you can't unless absent legislation or absent a social media platform taking action, Facebook or Twitter, for example, there's not much that you can, that you can do about it. Responsible newspapers do factual investigation. They have their feet held to the fire because of New York Times Company versus Sullivan. So if they print matter that's defamatory and that injures somebody, then if they published a false statement of fact, then they can be held accountable. But you can't sue everybody for every mistake that a newspaper uh, makes. The only thing that tends to hold a newspaper in line is um, accountability through civil causes of action. It's difficult to regulate newspapers statutorily. Um, Florida for you, you can't force a newspaper to accept opposing points of view, for example. Uh, so it's very difficult to, uh, to regulate. And as Sunstein pointed out, once uh, a dangerous idea takes root, it's kind of like a cockroach. It's really, really hard to kill. It's just always out there. What about some a place like Fox News, where they just make weird, you know, uh, untrue statements as fact, and they don't have to provide any proof that what they're saying is true? They do not. QAnon does not. But then the question is, what's the mechanism? How do you go about deciding whether or not what they say is true or is false? And that's where the idea, and it may be, in, may be totally ineffective. I'm as far as the theory of the First Amendment is concerned, the question is whether or not truth rebuts truth, all right? So you see something on Fox, you don't like it, you flip over to MSNBC or CNN, or if your comfort blanket happens to be the New York Times, you pick that up. Um, or if you're bothered by the New York Times, then you may find your refuge in Fox News, who knows? It, uh, it depends. You may go to somebody's household and maybe that there's a steady diet of, of, of Fox News and people do believe that. Well, the whole idea, I guess, of the marketplace of ideas is that you get a lot of ideas from different places, uh, but people don't do that. People tend to be hardened. If people tune into Fox News and that's where they get their news, then they're looking for reinforcement. Um, and I'm guilty of that myself. Uh, very much guilty of that. And I know I'm constantly looking uh, for information that reinforces my view about a certain, certain issue. Uh, but there's not really any way that government can regulate uh, short of permitting certain sorts of civil lawsuits to be assessed against those individuals. And then, of course, this always has political consequences. And the only way we can fight that out is through an election. And you may have a substantial number of people who believe either that this past election was 
legal or substantially illegal. There's just no solution. Hey, Dave, do you have a question? I do. Um, the Citizens United case uh, that was decided about 10 years ago uh, effectively gave corporations um, First Amendment rights, free speech rights, some claim that gave corporations citizenship status and to some extent. What's your assessment? And many, many believe it was wrongly decided and had negative, significant negative consequences. What's your assessment of how strongly the arguments were made and how solid this, the reasoning was in the Supreme Court decision? And if it wasn't solid, how likely it is for the Supreme Court to at some point redecide re it differently? I think the chances um, <laughs> right now, chances of Citizens United are overturned. Um, I, would, uh, I would not bet the farm on it. I bet the farm on retention of Citizens United. So one of the things that Citizens United did was to tilt the playing field. Now, one of the notions, and, and certainly Citizens United skewed the marketplace of ideas. So who gets to speak more? Who gets heard more? Um, now, may be that the internet was perceived to be uh, an equalizer, at least at the outset, but I don't know that it's turned out to be that way. But the basic concept underlying Citizens United is that uh, money is speech and money, as you know, money talks. So you think of the impact of PACs and super PACs and the importance of money. Think about the amount of money that was spent on advertising in this last election and not just the presidential election, what the trickle down effect was. I would imagine probably some of you, maybe many of you sent money to uh, people running for office in other states if you thought it was gonna be a close election. But that's the notion that money is a form of expression. Money talks, money is speech. And what Citizens United has done to a significant degree is to skew the playing field. The people with the most money have the most access to speech. Um, I don't think there's a chance that the Supreme Court, because of all of the possibilities of corruption and so on, that the Supreme Court would take the position to move away from Citizens United. I don't see that happening at all. But that's a really important point to make. Citizens United has had a lot to do uh, with tilting the playing field. People with the most money get the most speech. Okay. Joseph, you have a question. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, this is less outside the realm of our current political system and our laws. Um, like, what, what do you look for when it comes to, you said you deal with, you know, reinforcing your ideas and things like that and looking for things you agree with. Um, like, what do you look for when it comes to, you know, all the sectors in the marketplace of ideas with regards to um, good information? Like, I've looked into essentially like three, if you want to call it conspiracy theories, you know, the global warming evolution and FDR didn't pull us out of the Great Depression and Her Herbert Hoover is this great guy. And all of them are just terrible, you know, ideas. And it's just like, I mean, it can be hard to sort. There's many different, there's schools here, there's school, there's community college, there's Ivy League schools, there's conservatives, there's liberals. It's just hard to sort through so many different ideas. And uh, I guess that's my question. Well, I'm not sure I'm understanding, but one of the right. problems is that these that these conspiracy theories catch on. People believe those conspiracy theories. And to a certain extent, social media even fosters people who believe in those social media or believe in those conspiracy theories because of the way algorithms are set up to give you news feeds that tend to reinforce ideas that you already have. So social media can actually enforce um, those sorts of thoughts, those sorts of ideas. People have always had conspiracy theories. Um, there's nothing, nothing unique about that. It's just that they're amplified now um, by social media. 
And so the question is, can they be regulated? All right, well, that's what we sort of got to, or the point that we got to at the uh, tail end of my um, talk. So who regulates social media? Well, social media itself is going to have to regulate itself unless Congress is gonna be able to pass some sort of constitutional legislation that limits the kinds of things that are gonna appear on the internet. And do you really want government to decide to somehow be able to pick and choose as to the content on the internet? Do you really want government to do that? Or for that matter, do you want Mark Zuckerberg to be doing that? Do you want this new Facebook Supreme Court to be doing that? Um, who is gonna moderate us? And who decides um, what's appropriate and what's inappropriate? There are real problems with that. So we come back, I suppose, to the marketplace of ideas and speech rebuts speech. But the problem is, and people have criticized that notion because social media has allowed for the reinforcement of these sorts of, uh, these sorts of conspiracy theories, among other things. And um, people are almost, after a time, hardwired. Uh, but how do you get at that? How do you get at it? How do you legislate? Can you think of a way to legislate? And lots of times when there's a suggestion that there should be limitations, such as the uh, Safe Tech Act that uh, Governor Klobuchar, among others, are advancing. Ron Wyden, who was initially responsible for Section 230, says this is going to you do that and it's going to destroy the internet. All right. Well, do you want to do that? Do you want to uh, shoot that platform uh, because of the abuses? I mean, there are a huge number of abuses. People abuse each other to beat the band on the internet. Uh, people get bullied, they get harassed, there's racial discrimination. Uh, sex-based uh, discrimination on the internet. Uh, there are all sorts of horrible practices. And so how do we go about getting at those things? Can we get at them through legislation? Um, certainly Twitter has its standards, Facebook has its standards, but there are other social media platforms that don't have any standards at all. And that's where if you shut people down, that's where they're gonna go. Um, I don't see any way to uh, I don't see any way to stop it that's consistent with the First Amendment. You would like to think that people are more open uh, to ideas, but we're not. It's frustrating, I know. Yeah. Ron Lindemann, you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Harlan. Uh, Energy Reliability Council of Texas. Now they came out and they said, well, you know, five days before the cold snap came, they came out and said, you know, we got this. We are, they told the governor that uh, we can handle this. We, we got it. We got it figured out. That we know about cold weather. And well, then the governor thought that he would, that the uh, Energy and Reliability Council of Texas was just talking about the marketplace that he works in, that he just communicated to the, to the um, electrical electric power companies that, you know, we got a cold snow coming. The Texas governor thought, oh, well, you know, these guys know what they're doing. They know how to handle cold weather. But they really were talking past each other. How liable is it that the ERCOT says, oh, we got this covered? I mean, if they really wanted to give out reliable information, you know, almost anybody who lives in Minnesota and has been through a power outage would tell you what to do. And they didn't even come close to really understanding it. And I guess the question is, you know, when, you know, how liable is the them? And, and what about practicing medicine without a license? Why is that illegal? But you can, you can talk all you want about anti-vaxxing and all these other things. I mean, uh, that's my question. So those, those two questions, correct? I, I okay. would think so, maybe. I'll, yeah. let, I'll let the I professor cheated. handle it. Sorry. One has to do with e ERs, uh, the, the regulate, Regulatory Commission of Texas. And the other one has to do with uh, anti-vaxxing. Well, same thing. I mean, the latter certainly involves uh, conspiracy theories and uh, they spread like wildfire on the internet through social media pages they get reinforced there are a lot of people who are skeptical about the uh, about the uh, about the vaccine um certainly we have concerns about whether or not government is giving us accurate um information and uh when the pandemic hit uh where did you go to get 
accurate information. I mean, did you get it through the White House briefings? Um, you may have seen the briefings where there's a question about uh, the impact of disinfectant on, uh, on uh, COVID-19. I mean, you saw all of that. So where do you go to find out what the uh, truth is if you can't rely on government to uh, give it to you? Well, I don't know. Um, people simply uh, are skeptical and there's really nothing that you can do about that. Um, so we come back to the same sort of same sort of problem. It's up to government to determine what sort of a message to, uh, uh, to send. Government controls that message. So who do we want to hear from? Do we want to hear from the White House press secretary or the president, or would we rather hear from uh, Dr. Fauci? Uh, and so who gets to speak and who do we believe? Have we really turned the corner with COVID-19 or are we facing increased problems? Um, so there's just, there's just simply no way that, that, uh, that you can drive people into what you might perceive or what I might perceive to be mainstream truth. You might, uh, if you live in Minnesota, think that Governor Walz has, uh, has overstepped his bounds and what he's telling us really isn't, uh, really isn't accurate. People's First Amendment rights, as they say it, are being uh, the right to earn a living. The right to due process of law is being violated by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the governor. But you may also think that we have a better idea of where we stand with respect to COVID-19 than people in other states. Uh, for example, South Dakota might be a good comparison. Um, on the energy question, I don't know, I'm, I'm really quite surprised. I did not realize that the uh, problem in Texas was caused by the Green New Deal. Um, so we learn something all the time, uh, right? I was also surprised to know that uh, wind turbines can cause cancer. Um, and I didn't know that either until I heard that from the president of the United States. Well, I mean, it's a chronic problem. Uh, can you believe uh, what the government is, is, is telling you? Um, what was it that Ronald Reagan said? Um, the nine most fearsome words in, uh, in history are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> you never, you never, no, you have to, if you're really gonna be a good citizen, Try to try to what get your news from a variety of different sources and talk to people, uh, and uh, maybe you do it on social media. Maybe you do it through Zoom meetings. Undoubtedly, you do it through the kinds of meetings and your and your breakout sessions that you're that you're going to have once we're finished uh, talking. Once again, I mean, there's just no crystal clear solution. If people are telling you things that. Uh, that you think are absolutely wrong, really what you need to end up doing, particularly if they're government officials, is to exercise your right to vote. And uh, really the bottom line is that you want to try to elect public officials who are accountable. There's just no clear solution. I wish I had one. Mark Tosin, do you have a question? I do, thank you, Harlan. Um, the, the FCC's fairness doctrine which has since been repealed, required opposing views on media. Uh, why was it repealed? Was it in accordance with the First Amendment? And do you think it should be reinstated? Well, I don't know. Fairness doctrine tends to interfere with editorial discretion. There are plenty of other alternatives. Um, so um, there were some serious concerns that it was in fact inconsistent with the uh, First Amendment. And I would not like to see the Fairness Doctrine uh, come back and require the media to uh, provide equal time. Um, I think that uh, I think the uh, system has to be wide open, consistent with my views of the marketplace of ideas concept. I don't think government should uh, regulate what, uh, what the media has to say. Okay, Jerry Smith, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, and it connects to something you did talk about earlier, and but it goes back to this issue of the marketplace of ideas and the rationale for free, free speech put forward by Milton and John Stuart Mill, uh, the belief that in these the struggle between ideas, truth will win out. Uh, I think what we've seen is that it doesn't win out. 
at least not with a lot of people. We've got millions of people in this country who believe that Donald Trump won the election and all the evidence works against it and yet they don't change their minds. So my question is, um, is there any thought among legal scholars about addressing that by somehow adopting our view of free speech or are we simply in a position where we have to hope that over time and through public education, we get to a more thoughtful and informed public? Is that our only hope or are there things that are being considered being done vis-a-vis -vis freedom of speech that might address the fact that no, the marketplace of ideas is quite inefficient and we often get stuck with people having mistaken beliefs? You all have such good questions. This is really interesting. I'm not sure what the best way is to attack that. But let's think about hate speech, for example. One of the terrible problems uh, is ongoing. Hate speech, and it's it's. I know particularly this has been, been a terrible outburst. I heard an NPR segment, I think maybe within the last week, about um, attacks on Asian Americans in San Francisco, physical attacks, verbal attacks, Asians in general, particularly since COVID nineteen, uh, have been subject to terrible and ongoing discrimination. So hate speech, how can you regulate hate speech? Well, the European view is, well, if we have certain sorts of words, expressions that are highly objectionable, that we should be able to regulate those. A few years ago, I was sitting in a sheriff's court. It's like a district court in Edinburgh. And there was a trial of an individual uh, who had uh, used a racial epithet against another person and that was in violation of Scottish law. And so it was a criminal trial. And uh, after the trial was over, I had a bunch of students with me in a summer session there. The sheriff, uh, the judge, if you will, came out to, uh, to talk to us. And he said, you know, I know what you're thinking, uh, but let me tell you what our theory is. You can't punish somebody for using those sorts of racial epithets in the United States because it would interfere with the First Amendment. We have a different view in Scotland. We think that if you stop people from doing that, if you suppress the use of that kind of terminology, then eventually it will disappear. Eventually it will disappear. Um, so in Europe, it may be that depending on which country you're in, it may be that using certain sorts of racial epithets can in fact be punished. In the United States, uh, no, no. Not unless it runs afoul of perhaps discrimination in employment, maybe discrimination in education. If somebody discriminates against you on the basis of race, then you'll have a claim under a state human rights statute, the Minnesota human rights statute, for example, or maybe under Title VII, but if somebody hurls opprobrious, opprobrious epithets at you on the street, you really have no recourse. People have suggested that there should be civil actions for that, but that's not our theory of the, uh, of the First Amendment. In Europe, it's a crime to deny the Holocaust. The United States, that's red meat for conspiracy theory, theorists. Uh, so, Denying the Holocaust, should people be able to do that? Well, I don't know. Um, certainly, I don't think that they should, but should it be subject to a penalty? Should somebody end up, some countries you can go to prison for it. One of my colleagues actually was in Rwanda and he made the mistake of uh, denying the Holocaust and he ended up spending some time before he was finally politically uh, released. He denied the Holocaust. It's a crime to do so in Rwanda. All right, so do you want to have a kind of system where speech is suppressed? And the thought is that if it's suppressed, then um, people will finally just sort of give up on it. Or do we want to try to meet that speech, those epithets with more speech? It's very difficult, for example, with hate speech to develop a constitutional means of regulation. Um, Various scholars have taken that position. Edward Chemerinsky has a recent book out on hate speech. Nadine Strassen, former president of the American Civil Liberties Union, has a book out on hate speech. And they both take the position that you can't really regulate hate speech. Um, 
no matter how lawful it is, consistent with the First Amendment, unless it crosses some other line. If it's a hate crime, for example, somebody is motivated by racial animosity and commits a crime, assault, battery, then it's subject to punishment. But people are free to assert those ideas. But then we come back to that basic question. If government gets to pick and choose, then does government decide what's orthodox? What kinds of words you can use and what kinds of words you can't use? There's a very important Supreme Court decision from 1971. It's Cohen versus California. And it involves um, what you wouldn't think would ordinarily be a, uh, a federal case. In fact, the court comments on that. It's kind of surprising that this case got to the Supreme Court of the United States. But a guy by the name of Cohen decided to wear a jacket in the uh, LA County Courthouse. And if you're sensitive to, uh, uh, to uh, off-color language, just plug your ears for the moment. But the uh, jacket said, fuck the draft. And uh, the question was whether or not they could be prosecuted for disturbing the peace. Now, he was not wearing that jacket uh, in a courtroom. That would have been a different story. Uh, and there would have been contempt. But uh, just in the uh, quarter of the Los Angeles County Courthouse. And once again, um, the Supreme Court said, well, government can't single out for punishment one particular epithet, one particular kind of hate speech denying the Holocaust. I think if we all got together today, put together a list, it'd be a pretty lengthy thing, a, a pretty lengthy list of things that we really would be happy if people didn't say. We'd have a long, long list. So do we want to enact that list and then keep adding to it uh, as we decide the kinds of things that uh, people should be allowed to say or shouldn't be allowed to say? That's the problem. Uh, Suzanne, did you have a question? Suzanne Perry. Actually, um, Mark asked my question. I was also interested in the fairness doctrine, partly because um, I heard that Rupert Murdoch wanted to set up a um, station in Britain similar to Fox News, and he could run into trouble with laws over there that require you to have a balance of views represented. But I think if, if I'm correct, Part of the issue here is that originally the law was justified because broadcast stations had access to the airwaves and that was a very you know, limited um, commodity. So the government could justify regulating them. I don't see how it would fly now with cable news and podcasts, et cetera. Yeah, there's so many different sorts of, uh, <clears throat> of media, one of the most interesting Supreme Court cases. Well, they're all interesting one way or the other, I guess, but there's FCC versus Pacifica Foundation. I mean, you know who George Carlin is, right? Um, and I don't know if you ever heard his monologue or heard about the monologue. I'm certainly not gonna repeat it. Seven filthy words. Um, well, he was doing his monologue one day in a television program uh, when somebody was driving along with his young son in the car and heard that person made the complaint about that uh, to the FCC and the FCC suggested that perhaps there could be regulation because of the fact that um, he had in effect a captive audience, this young kid and uh, because there's limited access to radio and because there's a history of regulation, radio was treated differently than regulation of other media. Cable, perhaps the internet, which is this vast, as the court has said, this vast public forum. Um, but yes, uh, I, think that, uh, I think that what you're saying is, is correct. Um, absolutely. Um, I, I'm gonna sneak in a question before I turn to Ron. Um, and it has to do with free speech on campus. Um, and we know that, you know, campus is, it's not the government, but they do receive public funds. Most, a lot of the universities do. How does the, what's the interplay between First Amendment rights and the ability of, let's say, professors to speak their mind uh, in classes or outside of classes, but on campus? Well, it depends. There are ways to regulate 
that aren't specifically legally sanctioned. So if we're talking about a, a public university, <clears throat> if a university just simply receives funds, uh, it's possible that those funds can be conditioned on universities taking certain action. The question might be whether or not uh, university runs afoul of the First Amendment. One of the issues a few, year, a few years ago really had to do with the don't ask, don't tell policy. And some law schools refused to let military recruiters come in and recruit on an equal basis with other recruiters. So in Minnesota, for example, our law school decided, by the way, there was a Solomon Amendment enacted by the, uh, by the Congress. And it said, if you want the federal funds that you're entitled to, you allow military recruiters to come on campus. All right, various law schools challenged that regulation. They said, look, it interferes with our First Amendment rights. Um, this is compelled speech, like in West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. You're just stuffing us down our throats. You're forcing us to essentially take the public position that excluding gays from the military is constitutional. Well, the case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court said, um, no, there's no way that allowing military recruiters on campus would in any way be identified with a specific position on the part of these law schools that they sanction uh, exclusion of gays in the military. There's just simply no uh, connection. It's going to be a problem if government tries to condition uh, the receipt of federal funds, as Donald Trump wanted to do, on openness on campuses. There's a certain cancel culture that goes on. You're all familiar with that term. So what happens if somebody wants to bring a very unpopular speaker uh, on board? Should the campus be able to do that? Well, I don't know, uh, as a general proposition, uh, there's the normative question of whether or not that should be done, the legal question of whether or not that person can legally be excluded. Now, sometimes there are two different questions. If we're dealing, say, with the speaker issue, you certainly wanna have a diversity of views and goodness gracious, maybe the last place you'd wanna exclude that diversity of views would be uh, in a public university. You want to have that exchange of views, even if the views are unpopular. But then on the other hand, it's possible to shut people down with protests. There can be this cancel culture. And at some point, it may be that the university would have to take the position, look, it's going to cost us an enormous amount of money um, to provide security for that particular individual. And so the university may decide that it's not going to bring in the speaker. Well, is that appropriate? No. Uh, should the university try to accommodate the speaker? Yes. Now, private individuals, professors, well, they might be public officials, but what happens? What happens if, uh, if I want to take a position, for example, in my class that might be uh, unpopular, all, all sorts of ways to shut me down, but I'm tenured. I'm also at a private law school, but I'm tenured. And so if somebody wants my job, then they're going to have to come up with a reason to fire me for cause, all right? And of course, the whole notion of tenure is intended to provide for academic freedom so that I get to speak out on what I think are important issues, all right? So uh, academic freedom is intended to protect that. It doesn't give you freedom, I think, as some people sometimes think, say anything that you want under any circumstances. Uh, it doesn't go that far. Uh, it has that First Amendment tinge to it. It's intended to encourage um, open dialogue. I could not be terminated if I were at a public law school. Well, not private law school either, but at a public law school, if I took a position on a public issue and people didn't like it. And it happens all the time. People will take those positions and then somebody's gonna say, you ought to fire that SOB. Uh, nobody should be able to take that kind of position. Well, you see people doing that all the time and then you end up seeing them resigning from that position, but that's due to public pressure. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to do with them being fired for cause. So professors, teachers certainly uh, have academic freedom. Can they be forced to resign? Absolutely, it happens all the time. There's so much pressure that the person just decides that they don't wanna continue in the job. Does that have anything to do with the First Amendment? Nothing at all. It has to do with, uh, with private or public pressure. Um, so does that work? Sure, it works all the time. You read about it in the newspapers uh, all the time. But try to fire somebody just for simply stating an idea. Well, 
premise. There's a quite an interesting point, by the way. Um, one of the people on the Facebook so-called Supreme Court uh, is a former law professor, former 10th Circuit federal judge by the name of Michael McConnell. In teaching one of his law classes to try to make a point, he used uh, a racial epithet, the N-word. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend doing that in class. And he's been heavily criticized and people have said, keep him off that board. If somebody's gonna take that position, he's got no business being there. He ought not to be teach, he ought not to be teaching. Well, I don't know. We talk about that sort of stuff all the time. And if you wanna do something like that, uh, then you certainly should take into consideration what the feelings are of your students. But then you have academic freedom in your classroom too, to try to conduct it however you see fit. You may not get fired for it. You may not get detenured for it, but there is a cancel culture that's very much at work. Any one of us can be shut down if there's enough public pressure and we don't want to face it. George Kane, do you have a question? Uh, sure, thank you, Harlan. Um, in uh, Article 3, Section 2, there's a line that I'd like uh, some clarification on. It says, in all of the cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. So can the Congress pass a law banning some sort of, uh, any sort of speech and say, and the courts are not allowed to uh, review this? Well, I guess it depends on what your talking about, this is, uh, George is talking about Article 3 of the uh, Constitution. And there are nine heads of jurisdiction um, in Article 3 of the Constitution. Um, I think that's the right count. Nine major heads of jurisdiction, including in cases involving uh, federal questions. Um, that doesn't mean that Congress has to vest authority in the Supreme Court of the United States to hear everything. I don't know what you, what you have in mind. Well, uh, some something like uh, banning Nazism, for example, banning uh, allegiance to the Ku Klux Klan, something you know, general like that, generally considered odious, and then say, and the court can't review this. Um, well, certainly that's been. Well, there, there have been constitutional amendments that uh, attempt to do that. I think that would be unconstitutional. Um, think about busing, for example. Uh, think about the abortion issue. Uh, the best way to handle that question is to, um, is to uh, enact or adopt constitutional amendment. Outlawing abortion, outlawing busing. People are considering constitutional amendments all the time. Um, but if, and I would assume it would be Congress, it would have to be Congress, right, to limit the jurisdiction of the court. Right. Congress would say you don't have jurisdiction just in cases involving attempts to limit speech by Nazis. Um, honestly, you don't know what would happen. It sounds an awful lot like, uh, like an attempt to uh, discriminate on the basis of viewpoint, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just curious to the, you know, the, the scope of those words, exceptions, and uh, what was the other word, uh, regulations? Yes. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a, 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 a crystal clear answer to your question. My, my sense is that no, uh, Congress would not be able to do that. Okay, we have, uh, we're, we're almost at the end of our Q&A session. We have one last question, Mark Tosin. Thanks. Uh, just tacking on to the end of that um, conversation, uh, as a professor of constitutional law, do you think the Constitution is extremely difficult to um, amend and change? And is there uh, uh, is it is it too much so? Um, are we? I mean. Other democracies around the world have uh, have the ability to change constitution in uh, in much less difficult fashion than the United States. What's your opinion on um, amendments and constitutional um, conventions? Well, constitution could be amended. It's been amended 27 times in the history of this country. And first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights came in 
1791. So since 1791, there have been only 17 other amendments to the, uh, to the Constitution. It's extremely difficult uh, to amend the Constitution, um, either through a constitutional convention or through passage of the amendment uh, through the House and the Senate by two thirds vote and then ratification by three fourths of the states. It was intended by the framers to be extremely difficult to amend the Constitution. Should it be that difficult? Um, I think yes. Otherwise, you know, some states have constitutions that are amendable, almost like legislate, uh, like uh, ordinary legislation, <laughs> and they have numerous constitutional uh, amendments. Um, it seems to me that it shouldn't be easy. Um, in some senses, though, it seems to me maybe it should be easier. Why can't we have an equal rights amendment, for example, in this country? Uh, why has the equal rights amendment not yet been ratified? Isn't that, isn't it fairly obvious? What possible arguments could there be against giving women equal rights? And maybe that's an argument in favor of- uh, of uh, Drafted in the army. If it was rigid pro the process, but it seems to me that you wanna make it, uh, that you wanna make it hard because otherwise then the constitution becomes very much like ordinary legislation. Uh, so these are fundamental principles that apply to all of us. And, and those principles should be extremely difficult, I think, to change. That's my opinion. I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll terminate the Q&A session. Before I, I turn it over to Audrey, I just want to thank you on behalf, uh, Mike, on behalf of Humanist MN for just a, a terrific presentation and a very forthright Q&A uh, yeah. uh, session. Yeah. And we really appreciate your taking the time to uh, to appear today before our group. Thank you so much. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye bye.